So originally I'm, I'm Turkish, I was born and raised in Istanbul and then I moved to the US uh, to go to college here and I ended up staying and in my experience I uh, had the chance to um, live in the East Coast, the West Coast and all different parts of this, this uh, great country and uh, one thing that I have seen uh, in the last couple days uh, which I think is a really valuable uh, lesson for everybody is that uh, even though there's a lot of technology and we're surrounded with a lot of uh, things that allows us to connect with each other, I think the most important thing is community and uh, having ownership of your own community and um, having that feeling and having uh, a vision to be able to execute uh, things that might seem impossible uh, in, a, uh, in a community that might not be the, one of the largest metropolitan areas in this country is actually a very um, respectable and accomplished vision and uh, I think uh, it is the community that promotes that kind of vision so I would like to congratulate everybody for that first. Um, second, um, I uh, am in a way a technologist to an extent that I pay attention to technology and I teach myself how to use those technologies uh, as long as it is uh, practical and useful for uh, an application or an artistic vision. So uh, I am not a roboticist, I'm not an engineer, I'm an architect by training and an artist and um, so a lot of things that I'm going to present to you uh, happen with a lot of collaborations with many people and also very inefficient processes that I would probably benefit from by just directly collaborating with somebody that knows a lot better than I do. So um, in that level also bear with me. Um, so first of all, uh, what I do and where I work. Uh, besides my own uh, architecture firm, uh, where I do uh, experimental installations as well as uh, more conventional buildings, I would say, which I'm going to walk you through uh, momentarily. Uh, I teach at uh, UCLA Department of Architecture and Urban Design and uh, as of last year we just started an innovation uh, lab called IDEAS uh, in, a, in a satellite location which happens to be the same uh, hangar building that Howard Hughes built uh, the largest airplane in history. Um, so in a way we're surrounded with innovation, we're surrounded with companies like YouTube and Google and their Los Angeles headquarters and a lot of uh, cutting-edge advertising agencies. So through our location, we actually have a lot of uh, cross-disciplinary interaction, uh, which is quite helpful. And uh, so how does architecture play into this? Uh, there are a lot of uh, things that technologists develop through their process and through their intellectual curiosity and their expertise, but they do not necessarily consider issues that are related to design and use and uh, in our lab what we try to do is to match uh, large companies with uh, architecture professors in order to work on year-long uh, research projects to uh, explore uh, territory that companies might not necessarily be paying attention to. For example, last year one of our professors was matched with Boeing in order to re-envision the factory environment. And uh, what came out of that was to design a robotic building that actually repositions itself around the plane that is being fabricated as opposed to a very inefficient uh, linear uh, process of fabricating a plane which is inherently a three-dimensional object. So there are a lot of uh, inefficiencies that are based on uh, prejudices that uh, technical expertise in a way gives birth to, and uh, we as designers, uh, I think, uh, can engage in that debate in ways that uh, engineers cannot, so uh, it is a very collaborative process. For example, uh, I am doing a six-week study with Tesla about the impact of uh, electric and potentially autonomous electric cars in the urban environment, and how would they affect the, the physical layout. So uh, those are the things that, um, that I'm generally interested in, but what I would like to focus on today is just a very brief presentation about the, the kind of the objective of architecture, so to say, and how can a robotic form of architecture can be envisioned. Uh, before I do that, uh, 
I want to, in a way, give a very, very quick summary of architectural history, which is very pompous of me, probably, but uh, I think uh, it might be required in order to be able to, for me to communicate uh, the points that I will make, which I think are, uh, in a way, originating from, from those intentions. So, um, in a way, architecture could be summarized as an imitation of nature. Um, what we do in, in the processes of construction and uh, the physics that involve construction is always based on uh, natural processes. For many centuries we have used natural uh, materials. Uh, we still continue to do so, even the most artificial material is always based on some kind of processing of a natural material. So in a way, whatever we do always becomes an extension of nature. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, there's a long ongoing debate about this in uh, architecture for many centuries. Uh, the slide that you're seeing is from the 15th century, uh, an etching that represents the primitive hut, which is considered to be like, let's say, the first shelter, uh, which is, as you see, it is uh, geometrically representing the, the principles of, of a shelter, which means that it has a roof, and it has pillars, and it has columns. But on the other hand, it is made out of trees. It is as if this disciplining of nature to be shaped in such a way that it fits our needs and desires. And that's, I think, uh, a philosophy that could extend into any kind of technological paradigm. Because we always, in a way, take nature, we look at it, we look at what we can use and what we cannot use, and then we, in a way, try to push our way through it, right? And we have done it very aggressively in 20th century, and now we are facing the consequences of it. And, uh, and we will continue to do so most likely for another 20, 30 years if we don't all die. I think we will make it through, because I'm inherently an optimist, but I might be wrong. Um, but I mean, this, this kind of imitation of nature always becomes a model, so to say. The slide that you're seeing is from a 19th century pre-modern architect, Violet Le Duc, which is uh, imitating uh, the joint structure of animals and uh, people and thinking about ways in which it could be applied to a kind of an architectural structure. And before that, if you think about the classical architecture, it's all very uh, classical columns and there's orders to them. And even those orders are based on the human proportions. If you look at a different approach, which is uh, Antonio Gaudí in Spain, again, uh, early 20th century, what you're seeing is that the uh, models that mimic uh, physical behavior and uh, how physical behavior uh, in a, in, for materials on different scale could be adapted into larger buildings. And if you look at mid 20th century, uh, the kind of uh, visions that people have for the future is that architecture almost disappears. It becomes a bubble, an environmental bubble that negotiates between the outside world and the inside, where the inside is just human beings and technology in, uh, in, in isolation. So, um, if we look at the Renaissance notion of what Leonardo da Vinci envisioned as like the humans being the center of innovation, human proportions, humanism, uh, humans' needs always uh, are prior to everything else, nature. Uh, in a way, we owe modernity to Renaissance because of this kind of focusing on what our needs are before nature's needs and our proportions and our uh, physicality, in a way dictating what objects do around us. I think we're at a paradigm shift where our consciousness rather than our bodies are becoming that very thing. As the invention of robotics and also other technologies that we're going to see in 21st century, which is going to be augmenting our bodies with technology and also allowing our consciousness to be able to uh, travel to different objects rather than just our biological bodies, I think we are dealing with a completely different set of physical parameters that would require us to rethink the world that we live in. So, actually we have started doing that uh, through uh, technological innovation and science. We have 
figured out abstract models that predict the growth of nature, right? For example, uh, through mathematics, we have dissected how a cauliflower grows. But a lot of these models are still idealized in the sense that when we zoom into the cauliflower, it's not like it is growing like a fractal. There's a moment when nature decides to leave one model and just enforce another model based on uh, contextual parameters. Uh, a cauliflower is not infinitely repeating from cellular level to whatever it is physically the same way. The same kind of thing applies to, let's say, crystals. If you look at a crystal, you would assume that if you just keep, you know, breaking a crystal into smaller pieces, it would always be self-similar. But if you look at the crystal in an electron microscope, it had a completely different form than what you see on the outside. So in a way, when we are looking at nature, we all, almost always have a very superficial understanding of it. It always is based on what we see immediately. So how can we have a more sophisticated understanding of it? The image on your left is the human brain, and the image on your right is, is a 3D print done by an architect for a potential uh, shell uh, of an enclosure. Uh, in a, way, in a way, nature uh, resorts to similar models when it has lack of information. For example, the human brain has the same morphology of a, uh, as a coral reef. It has the same kind of shape because it is trying to pack as much surface area in a restricted volume as possible. So these are the kind of informations that we opportunistically seek when we are looking into nature. But then, as we are simulating the forms of nature, some of the technical uh, tools that we use are not matching those. For example, if you think about the logic of 3D printing, it can uh, 3D print very complex forms, very organic forms, but it does them layer by layer. Not the same way that an organic form actually grows, which has its own structure, and its shape is based on that structural logic. So we, in a way, always betray uh, the rules of nature even though we're trying to imitate them at the same time. So why am I talking about all of this? Uh, I think it is important to, in a way, be aware of our relationship to nature when we're thinking about uh, intelligence. Uh, when we think about especially artificial intelligence, uh, because Artificial intelligence ultimately means that uh, there will be objects that are not organic objects, that are not biological objects that will carry uh, the same kind of uh, capability of reasoning. So within those uh, shorter parameters, it could be anything, right? It could be a house that has artificial intelligence. It could be uh, any object. It could be a car that has artificial intelligence. And we are surrounded with a more uh, rudimentary levels of artificial intelligence every day. Our phones are, in a way, uh, simple artificial intelligence. A calculator is artificial intelligence. Because it has a certain level of reasoning. Maybe it's not, it cannot make decisions and it cannot create things. But it can certainly process information. So, what I will talk about is first how intelligence requires motion, so to say. Not everything is motion is intelligent, but everything intelligent is in motion at some point. Every cellular activity, any plant, any biological being is always in motion or in some kind of transformation. Uh, and then I will just briefly talk about uh, robotic fabrication, how robots are used in their most traditional way, which is about fabricating buildings or components of buildings. And then I will talk about augmented architecture, which is uh, a form of architecture that is not physical, like in the form that you see in video games. But it is still perceivable to that it is still real. So what is the relationship between reality and physicality is, I think, something also very interesting that we need to figure out in our lifetimes. So first of all, architecture and motion. Uh, the relationship between motion of a person and architecture has been uh, pretty much discovered uh, primarily in the 15th century uh, in British landscape design. Even though these landscape designs were made to look natural, it is again a very manicured and disciplined uh, form of nature that is very composed. 
And the same kind of situation exists in radical buildings now. On your left uh, is a building that I worked on when I was working for Frank Gehry, who's the designer of, uh, who's the architect of um, uh, Disney Concert Hall. And um, this was years ago when he was my mentor. Uh, and the museum is finally done. And it is opening uh, this year. But as you see, what it is doing is it is representing motion, right? It is not in physical motion, but it is representing a kind of the sail-like motion and movement in an object that is inherently static, which is a building. On your right is another building that I worked on um, in Berlin, uh, which uh, takes natural forms, such as branches, as a kind of structural abstraction and applies it to the exterior of the building in order to, to, to free the building from columns so that there's more rentable space in the interior. So again, uh, these are just like two very dramatically different ways of thinking about a natural model and how to apply it into architecture within the context of motion. Here's another image of the, the Gary building. And these are the two of uh, my firm's designs, which is on your um, left, is, uh, is, is an is a, uh, opera house, and on your right is a library. And, uh, and the, the interesting, uh, or the objective behind uh, the formal complexity of these buildings is always uh, allowing the person to move through the building on top of it, underneath it, adjacent to it. And as they move, you will always see something different. That the shape is almost changing according to your proximity to it. So it is in a way simulating more motion as you are moving around it or through it or by it. Another project uh, that is currently under construction is uh, five villas that I'm building on the Aegean coast, uh, which is uh, in a way not only thinking about motion but also thinking about robotics as a means of fabrication. Um, The overall layout of the buildings is uh, done in such a way that uh, they are elliptical. I will show you in the plan. And there's a, there's a swimming pool in the middle. Uh, and uh, as you are moving through the building, the building is actually kind of uh, moving you up through the landscape. And you're spiraling around the swimming pool. And there's a, an environmental reason for this. Uh, and that reason is that the swimming pool as a large mass of water absorbs a lot of heat. And uh, this being a summer house will absorb majority of the heat from the interior. And uh, the, the courtyard in the middle almost acts as a chimney that sucks out all the heat and just vents it out from the top. Uh, and this kind of elliptical uh, orientation also allows for a kind of a gradient of privacy. You're entering from the living room, you go to the kitchen, and then you go up and it goes, gets more and more private as you, in a way, travel through the building in a spiral way. But on the other hand, since you have windows on the exterior, and as well as in the interior courtyard, you're always also taking advantage of cross-ventilation. Uh, the shapes that you see on the exterior is actually a structural uh, reason. Um, the exterior of the building is made up of a fiber reinforced concrete which is roughly around only two inches thick. And uh, they are uh, poured on molds that are uh, robotically fabricated. And uh, these wrinkles in a way create densities of material which become almost like columns and beams. So if you think about it like a piece of paper, if you bend a piece of paper and you place it uh, on, the, on, the, on the table, then that can stand, as opposed to a flat sheet of paper which will just fall. So these wrinkles in a way allow the exterior to stay intact, uh, meanwhile maintaining a use of a very small amount of material. And the insulation is done by a, 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 a a kind of a high performance fabric that is glued to the interior, which is tinselate, which is the same uh, fabric that you have in your ski jackets. Um, and it actually turns out that it provides good building insulation material with very small volume as well. 
So these are some of the kind of material technological innovations that could be used in an architectural scale. And also, you know, this is an example of like privacy, of how a kind of a architecture can create not only a focal point, but also privacy uh, simultaneously. And these are some views. Uh, this is the view from the interior, looking from uh, a sunken uh, a living room space with a fire pit to, towards the kitchen area. So right now, I will talk about specifically architecture and robotics, and how uh, there's this notion of automation in fabrication of building parts. But and in the next examples, I will show how we can go beyond this paradigm. And I will show a few uh, works from my colleagues, and then I will end with, uh, with a few projects that I am working on. Uh, this is a, a pavilion, an experimental pavilion that was done in Stuttgart, which is weaved from uh, carbon fiber and glass fiber uh, uh, robotically. It was first put into a metal jig, and then the robot weaved this pavilion around that metal jig, and then the metal the jig was removed from it. And then it uh, stays intact. Uh, because it is, it went through already a, a resin bath before it was being weak. This is just taking advantage of the slavish nature of a robot, uh, meaning how can I make the robot assemble uh, a large volume uh, by a by a small piece of material repetitively, and uh, this is done in only a matter of few hours uh, uh, through these. Uh, plastic balls, where the robot picks up the ball uh, and then puts a piece of glue and then uh, dabs it on the other uh, ball, picks up another one and just keeps repeating this process a few hundred thousand times. This is another example where we can actually take advantage of other phenomena such as uh, magnetics in order to uh, create uh, structures uh, if we were to mix uh, metals with uh, other polymers and uh, attach magnets to uh, robots and just pull them apart to create uh, structurally sound uh, buildings. And how can robots be used to assemble traditional uh, building materials in inventive ways? And in this case it is brick, but you could create in, you know, brick patterns without relying on the expertise of a human, uh, so that you can go directly from a computer design sketch into uh, a fabrication process in a matter of, let's say, days. I wouldn't say seconds or minutes because there's a lot going on in between those two processes, but even days is really a significantly fast design process. Another thing is, I think, important to think about is that if uh, 20th century was the century of mass production, then 21st century is a century of mass customization. Meaning, we are building machines that can deal with such high levels of data that we don't have to standardize things anymore. I mean, we're in the very beginning of 20th century, but we are making a lot of progress through sensing technology where robots uh, and other fabricating machines can actually differentiate between different kinds of objects and to recalibrate their positions accordingly. <coughs> so this is an example of that where if the same object is carved out differently uh, in different positions and assembled completely uh, variationally in order to build a wall. And the last example that I will show from colleagues is this uh, other aggregates method where a uh, robot with the help of a software uh, program uh, calculates how much material, in this case these star-shaped aggregates, uh, can be poured into a certain place in order to create a structurally sound a wall configuration, in order to finally create a semi-transparent enclosure. So this project that I am working on, in a way, is a, is a, is a, is a culmination of these ideas. Again, looking at nature in a microscopic scale, how uh, it is uh, on, your, on, on your right you see uh, snowflakes, and on your left you see uh, sand uh, configurations, which are so precise in their 
uh, geometric configuration as if they are made by humans. Um, we always envision nature to be much more organic, but it can surprise us. So the project is actually creating these so-called surface bricks that have different uh, levels of uh, resolution. And then they could be assembled into tree-like formations in different hierarchies. Uh, and it, as it goes out, it gets, the pieces get smaller and they get more detailed. In order to build a pavilion, that is again a kind of an aggregation of smaller pieces, but it becomes this very ornate and very uh, complex environment that is only built by four different shapes. Again, this is uh, not about imitating the look of nature, but looking at the logic of nature and how we can extract that logic in order to come up with new ideas of uh, construction. And the interesting thing is that not only that the robots assemble the structure, but they also disassemble it. We create a lot of junk in this world. Uh, so we create a lot of things that we're building. Whether we could build and unbuild things with the help of technology. Because, uh, you know, what if there could be a way to design objects so that uh, they only have a certain kind of lifespan? If you think about the conventional building right now, it only is designed for the lifespan of 40 to 50 years. So we already know that we will demolish most likely this building at some point in the next 30 years. So why can't we build things that could be disassembled much easily and with the help of technology? Again, as you see, this, this kind of art installation scale helps me explore technological ideas uh, as, a, as a kind of a idea first, and then it can find the applications in the real world in many different ways. For example, this kind of assembly technique could be used to, to build a shelter, temporary shelter in refugee camps. Uh, just like an art project doesn't mean that it has to be uh, confined within this kind of highbrow artistic space, but the idea can be explored in many kinds of different uh, practical applications. Again, this, the, the actual context of this is actually for the stage performance of an electronic music artist based in London, so that's my client. But again, I use these kinds of uh, opportunities to explore ideas that could mean much higher than just a simple um, show or like a stage show. The next part, the next paradigm that I want to talk about is about virtual reality, or as it is called now, augmented reality. It is uh, more of a kind of an understanding about non-material space. I mean, if you think about a country like uh, South Korea, 80% of their population regularly plays video games. That includes all ages. So uh, it, it is a huge paradigm that people actually have a, have a different kind of life in, in augmented reality. So for this, what I yes, uh, in order to explore this, what we did is with my students, we attached a camera to one of our industrial robots, and we filmed architectural models. So in order to explore this idea, uh, what I did is I so-called hacked the architecture exhibition that uh, exists in Venice. Uh, uh, every two years there's this big architecture exhibition. And uh, the curator of the exhibition included some architects. And what I did is I placed digital models in that particular physical space uh, of architects that he did not include. So if you, can, if you go to this exhibition, and download an app, and if you point your camera on your uh, device towards certain moments in the exhibition, these digital models pop up as if they are in that physical space. Um, so imagine the possibilities of this. You can embed digital information anywhere. You can tell your friend to, let's say, something secret to go find it, say, go to that tree in the garden and point your camera at it, and then you will see something. You will see a surprise. I mean, it could create all kinds of information 
in the physical environment without building it in the physical environment. So, uh, in a way, we have to get used to this notion of digital being real. Uh, digital is not uh, fake, it is actually a part of our reality. Uh, one of the philosophers that I really admire these days, uh, Manuel Castells, talked about this within the context of Facebook and Twitter. He said that it is not, you know, an alternative to reality anymore. We use it so much that it is a part of our reality. It is actually a part of real socializing when you're on the when you're on Facebook because it is something that you do on a regular basis and it is a device that you use to communicate. It no longer is if anything different than, let's say, talk to somebody on the phone. So I want to conclude with this notion of architectural intelligence. Uh, as I said, motion is a prerequisite for intelligence and in order for something to be intelligent, it has to be moving or it has to be responding to us. So how could that happen in the scale of architecture? Uh, it could happen in the scale of, let's say, climate control, and we see that uh, quite conventionally, you know, blinds change and, you know, windows shut off in order to regulate the airflow, etc., etc. But what if it could happen on a psychological level? Which uh, brings me to another installation I did called the Cerebral Hut. Remember, in the beginning of my presentation, I talked about the primitive hut. And, um, so right now, for me, the, the cerebral hut almost becomes this kind of technological space that responds to you uh, psychologically. So how do I do that? Um, in order to create a space that is in motion, you have to also explore the principles of motion, motion and you have to have mechanisms that would allow you to do so. Um, and uh, when you do that, the devices that I use is, first of all, an EEG helmet. An EEG helmet is a device that is commercially available that measures concentration, uh, meditation, and blinking. It has three different kinds of inputs that you can put on your head, and it will, through the computer, show you uh, what your level of concentration is. So through extensive testing, uh, it became quite obvious that concentration is much more controlled than meditation. Like you can make certain math problems in your head or you can in, like imagine a very complex story with a lot of detail that will automatically trigger concentration. As opposed to meditation which has very unreliable kind of set of parameters. Relaxation is a very variable thing for many different kinds of people. So I limited the parameter to concentration which meant that the more you concentrated the more you could transform the space around you. So I will show you a little video of it. So uh, what you see here is these triangulated uh, panels that are uh, organized almost like a semi-dome-like configuration. And there's an electromechanical system that is controlled by the computer that pushes them and pulls, pulls them in and out. And uh, the geometric folding, in a way, in the interior allows this kind of transformation to happen. And it almost looks like a digital world, but it's actually a physical thing that is actually physically moving. So this kind of transition between the digital and the physical and the perception uh, that you would have uh, about what is real and what is uh, digital is, is just a general interest of mine. Uh, and on the exterior, there's a much more smooth, organic uh, feel to it, and the interior is much more constructed and is much more geometrically um, configured, so to say. Um, in order to achieve this, as you see, it's a very traditional form of construction, but it is designed in the computer. Again, one of the things that is very fascinating to me is that the design software, or the software in general that we use, is so much more advanced than the actual fabrication methods that we use. And the fabrication methods are so much more expensive that would match the complexity of the software. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in order to uh, balance that kind of um, difference between the industry and the sciences and the research. Um, so there's quite a bit of physical labor involved. One could theoretically or, you know, program a robot to do this. But 
Uh, like I said, there's an EEG helmet that you wear, and then there's uh, extensive computer coding and testing in order to determine the behavior of the electromechanical system. And then we tested different kinds of folding patterns to see which one is much more conducive to motion. So when you add a parameter like motion, it becomes much more complex. And uh, there are so many more parameters that you need to consider that is that falls outside the consideration of architecture, so to say. So it was first exhibited uh, in a museum, in the Modern Art Museum in Istanbul, and then it traveled to um, uh, Asachi Gallery in London, and then it was exhibited in a couple of venues in, uh, in the US as well. The last was uh, at the South by Southwest Festival by an event for Pepsi. So the next project is, uh, I have done a series of uh, research projects, smaller scale research projects with my students at UCLA. This is a, a, a fabricated panel that could be a part of a building. It's a one-to-one -one scale panel uh, that in a way uh, senses you approaching it and then it repositions itself according to you. And then when you touch it, it changes color. So think about it as a kind of a octopus-like iPad that could be a building. So, <laughs> So uh, the reason for this is like, what if buildings could sense your presence and they could contract and expand accordingly? They could reconfigure spaces and footprints accordingly. They could change the mood by communicating with you and they could respond to your mood. This could be a, a, not only used for pleasure, but it could be also useful in medical applications as well. Again, the, the idea is I think, to consider how an artistic project can lead to a practical application. This is another project that I did with my students, which is about attaching a folded uh, panel on, an in, on one of the large industrial robots that we have, uh, with these um, um, hinges uh, on the surfaces. And on the other uh, robot, we put a video projection. And uh, their motion is synchronized with each other and it is controlled by this device called the leap motion that detects your hand gestures. So when you're moving your hand in different proximities, the, the robots are changing uh, their positions in synchronization with each other to create an environment that is constantly evolving and changing. So this could be a fragment of a wall, this could be a part of a wall, even though it is roughly around 10, 12 feet tall. But uh, the kind of graphics that we projected on it was to experiment with how we can play with our perception of depth. You know, because there's a physical deformation that happens, but what if I'm projecting something that erases that deformation? So we were experimenting uh, to see if there was a difference between what we see versus what is actually happening in physical reality. And it was a huge, uh, in a way, technological accomplishment to be able to sync a sensory device with an industrial robot that has a closed system due to safety reasons and match it with a kind of an architectural logic that is in motion. So it is, in a way, exploring a lot of different levels of research simultaneously. And it is attempting to do that in a, in a way that is hopefully beautiful. And the last project that I will show is this project called Morphogram, uh, which in a way carries that paradigm to its extreme by using uh, quadrocopters, which are practically drones that you can control very precisely. And this is a project work in progress. As you see, you can, uh, through the use of uh, um, infrared cameras, you can control the position of quadrocopters very precisely as if they're like a flock of birds or um, bugs, and uh, you can, uh, in this project, what we are doing is uh, I'm putting an array of them in order to actuate a triangulated surface that is made out of uh, plexiglass. And as an initial test, it will cycle through different kind of architectural types, like a dome, or a pyramid, or, uh, or other forms that you will see. But then, uh, as, a, as, a, as a secondary uh, 
experimentation, we will connect it to the EEG device, which is the brainwave device that I talked about in the cerebral hub, to see whether we can create enclosures that could be a reflection of your mind or your, your mental state. What if uh, you could create a kind of a hovering enclosure around you and above you that would travel with you, that would always reflect how you feel. And uh, again, these are all within the realm of possibility. We have the technology to do this. Uh, why? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I think the interesting thing is uh, about our level of expectation from our physical environment. Why do we build the pyramids? Why do we build palaces? Why do we want to live in beautiful buildings? Why do we uh, manicure nature? Why do we educate ourselves? A lot of things that we do are related to the way that we are as humans, which I think just go beyond the paradigm of practicality. Um, so. Just to summarize, uh, what I mean by architectural singularity, and I'm honored to have people who actually, to have people who uh, have researched the field of singularity and actually created it here, uh, and I'm only adapting it into the design field, is that architectural singularity is a notion where architecture becomes the body rather than our, just our physical bodies. What I mean by android architecture is that architecture is something that is like a human that has become a subject, that is something that we can have a dialogue with. Uh, J.G. Ballard, the prolific sci-fi uh, sci writer, in one of his stories talks about uh, a family who goes into a house that is a psychotropic house, that is an artificially intelligent house. and. Um, when the real estate agent is uh, showing them around the house, the house is reacting very erratically because there had been a murder in the house before uh, these, uh, this new couple came to see the house. So uh, we will put a lot of uh, meaning in the future and intelligence into inanimate objects that we see around us. And we will seek to communicate with them as we somehow isolate ourselves from each other, but also look for alternative ways to communicate with each other. And augmented reality is also a consequence of this again. We, will no longer, we no longer seek to find pleasure in physical objects. We look for reflection of our minds and our imaginations to surround us all the time. And we are no longer limited by this physicality. Thank you for... <laughs> Sticking around, and uh, I would love to hear your questions. Yeah, so. Uh,